Welcome to the Leadership Launchpad Project. I'm Rob Kalvaroski, and as always, the yang to my yin is here, Susan Hobson. Susan, how are you? I'm fired up. We have some great conversations today, and I know this will be no different. So I can hardly wait to get this party started. To let's go. How about you, sir? How you feel? Absolutely. I'm I'm pumped. We had a great couple conversations, and now coming up is a third. And so mm -hmm. obviously we have to start off with a quote. And I have one here from Harvey Firestone, the founder of Firestone Tires. Oh, I played yeah, hockey with his granddaughter. Oh, really? <laughs> Did you know that? Yeah, I played with no. her at Princeton, actually. We have a our library at Princeton is actually the Firestone Library. It's the biggest library in all universities in the world, I believe. Fun fact. <laughs> Random. Yeah. Well, so we have a quote here and he says, the growth and development of people is the highest calling of leadership. Tell us why you picked that one today. Well, I picked that one today because of our special guest. Tim Lupinacci is here with us. He's the chairman and CEO of Baker Donaldson one of the largest law firms in the United States. But also what I wanna dig more into is he's the founder of Everybody Leads, an organization that fosters leadership among underserved communities. And that's where I really wanted the quote to come from is, is that's literally what Tim has gone out to do on his mission. Mm -hmm. So before we get there, Tim, how are you? Rob, I am great. I'm so I'm pumped just like Susan and I'm ready to dive in and talk about leadership and uh, just to hang out with you all for an hour because I've so much enjoyed getting to know you uh, with your work and your podcast. So absolutely. Thank you so much. And maybe before we get more into you, what do you think about the quote? I, I love it. It actually is what drives me to get up in the morning. I mean, I say that even in the you know for-profit world that I live in, the CEO of, of Baker Donaldson, but um, it's our people. I mean, I, you know, we can't, we have financial metrics. We got to pay the bills to keep the lights on. We've got aggressive goals, but um, if I'm not in, impacting people that I work with and pouring into our people and helping them achieve their dreams and goals, I really don't have any um, fulfillment in that. So um, I I think I, I wrote it down as you were saying it, because I think that's exactly how I try to live. So I love it. And how long have you been trying to live that way, sir? Let's rewind <laughs> the game tape a little bit and plug our folks into <laughs> your story. And, yeah. and what called you to this mission around leadership? Well, it's really interesting. Uh, it's a great question, Susan, because I um, I came out of law school. I don't have any lawyers in my family. I didn't know lawyers. Uh, it was kind of like I stumbled into law school because I didn't know what to do with, with a mass comm major from college. And I thought maybe this First Amendment stuff, you know, there's a legal aspect to that. Maybe I'll do that. Um, but, so I'm, I, but now I go through law school and they get you all trained to go into corporate law and doing all this stuff, big law. Uh, and I joined a firm and uh, it was a, I was very much a transactional type thing. I got a project, I turn it in uh, and then I go to the next project. And about two years in, I had a mentor who was really tough boss, but um, uh, learned a lot from. And I turned in a project to someone who's a little bit older than me. And then we turned it in together to the boss. And he called us in our office the next day and was like yelling and screaming at us on a phone call about how we had totally messed it up. Uh, and he's yelling in front of all these other lawyers on the call saying, these idiots are going to stay here all night and get it right. Um, and of course, that's not a great leadership approach. Um, but uh, so we did stay a good bit of the night. We got it right. And I had drawn the short straw to take my boss, my mentor to court the next day. So I went to pick him up at his house. And it was a very awkward silence for a good bit of the drive. Uh, but then he apologized. He said, I shouldn't have yelled in front of other lawyers. And he said, the reason I was so aggravated with you is that I really see leadership in you. I see you as somebody who could really control and own your career and, and do some really incredible things. And, and I don't, I mean, I'm sure I'd had some people talking to me like that, but that was the first time I really remember thinking, well, if I'm a leader, I got to get better at this. And then as I built that and learned from it, the idea of like having one team member and two team members, it just really fired me up to see them succeed more than me. I mean, that was a long journey to get there. But um, so anyway, that's kind of the journey I'm, I'm on. And I would say it's much more heightened as I've gotten older. I've been practicing 33 years. I'd say certainly the last decade, that idea of the, the mindset off of maybe myself 
and all the economic aspects to just really um, get engaged in pouring into people. So, uh, and what what does leadership mean to you now after that last ten year part of the journey? Yeah, you know, I think it it is a lot about um, influence, about influencing others, helping them to um, helping others to accomplish their dreams, to 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 speak that confidence into them because I think I see that a lot still today and. I mean, I still struggle myself with the, you know, imposter syndrome at times, and I really don't know what I'm doing, but I see it a lot with particularly folks who are younger um, and, and trying to just help them um, figure out what's their vision and their purpose. I mean, I, I really like trying to see if some, if we can, and I've tried to do it myself, tie purpose. So even while we're, you know, in the trenches in particularly the legal industry, we're serving our clients, but in some instances, we're helping our clients maybe change the world because it's somebody that's impacting things that we really need. So um, so I think it's influence. It's about um, uh, just trying to help them believe in themselves and, and to grow. Just some thoughts. I love how you say just as if it's not <laughs> mucho importante. <laughs> well, right? I, yeah, no, it is. It is critically important. And it's hard because it doesn't like you can just walk around the hall and go, OK, you're a leader. You've got purpose. <laughs> you know, it really is about and by influence, I mean, like, not just because you have a title at all. It's more that I've invested hopefully in a person to know them, to get to know their dreams, what, what their talents are, what maybe they were trying to accomplish to then maybe be more specific in helping them, them along their journey. And, and that takes listening. It takes being genuine. It takes authenticity. All of that is built into what I think is that building that impact. So, um, but you're right. It, it's more than, than just a just. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> Tim, what I'd, I'd love to ask you for your perspective here, right, is, yeah. of course, you're an executive. And so how much time do you allocate each week towards those conversations where you're growing your folks? Yeah, that's a great question. And particularly um, as the organization's gotten bigger and then as I've um, had more responsibility, I've been in the, the role of CEO for five years Prior to that, I had run a business unit. Uh, it, it's harder uh, when we got like 1,300 people. It's harder to have that one-on-one -on -one with individuals. And so, say a couple things. Um, there's a weekly cadence of uh, meeting with the, the key executive team, where we're meeting for several hours. It's a lot of time on Zoom, but we get together in person several times a year. So I think that's one level. And then we have, I would say, a next level leadership group of about 50 people. Um, that we have monthly Zoom calls, but we get in person twice a year. We just did that a couple of weeks ago. And, and really, um, it's, a, it's a celebration of the prior year, but it's really trying to pour into them at that level. And then one thing that's been really important to me, and it's really been a fabric of our firm, it didn't start with me, is like getting out and being in the offices and walking the halls. Um, you know, uh, uh, and now with 23 offices, it's gotten harder. Um, to, you know, I think my predecessor, when we had fewer offices, would be in most offices at least twice a year. Uh, uh, now I've kind of worked with our COO that between the two of us, we're in every office uh, every year. And I was in I was in 90 percent of the offices last year. So it's it's some of that. And then being intentional, not just to say, oh, I've checked the box. I'm here. It's, um, you know, having uh, lunch with different parts of maybe it's a younger lawyers or the staff business services professional doing dinner and then literally just walking around and interacting with people. So, um, and we do that. I mean, there's a whole host of ways cause it is important. Um, we'll do like a ask Tim anything video conference a couple times a year where people can come in and ask whatever. And, and that's a lot of fun cause most often they're wanting to know about me outside of the office. Right. I mean, there's some, <laughs> there's some business, stuff, but I love, of course, who doesn't love talking about themselves and their music or their family. And so, Anyway, I love when you talk about leadership as, uh, you know, helping to influence our people to grow. And I also love this part of your story where you say that somebody had to actually point out to you that you were a leader. You didn't actually realize that. And so when you really think about the way you define that, everybody's a leader, right? Because like surely when we all wake up and go out the front door every day, we have a capacity to help influence people to grow, right? I totally agree, Susan. And, that, and that's kind of my philosophy, even around the nonprofit, which we can talk about, which is really a work in process. But I mean, that 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 is absolutely um, uh, when I became CEO, we did a town hall for the firm. And I said, made that exact statement. You know, if you're a receptionist, you can you have outsized influence of people coming to the office. Now, again, people don't come to the office as much clients, maybe, but they still do. 
for meetings. And, and uh, one of the best leaders I know is our receptionist in Baltimore, who not only does that, she owns anything she sees that needs to get done, right? And so she's influencing that office. And you could go ask any one of my colleagues there, and they would say that Nicole is just like this amazing leader. Um, and it's the same thing in your family, in the community, in church. Um, you know, um, it, it, you don't, it, it may be one other person that you're influencing, um, but you can really impact them by really owning um, whatever your job is, whatever your space is. Um, and uh, and I, I've, I've seen that. I mean, I've been influenced by so many people and, and most who don't have big fancy titles, you know. <laughs> Yeah, well, I think it's really important that we're talking about that. And then, Rob, you go just because, you know, it didn't even occur to you that you should start learning about this topic until somebody mm -hmm. pointed that out to you. Right. And we obviously on our show talking about leadership, we really look at that gap, you know, an average yeah. leader is on the job 10 years before they even get any formal leadership development and training. Right. But again, the sooner we all understand that we're we're all leaders. I mean, even the fact that we're leading ourselves every single day, the sooner we're going to go on that journey to start learning about how to be better at our influence, right? Yeah. And, and just think about the differentiation you can have as an organization or even a school or like a, a law school. If you were pouring uh, and teaching and providing skill building in leadership, I mean, that's just... Um, Talk about driving some engagement because it may not be that it's this, they may somebody ultimately may get that training and decide, well, this isn't the organization for me, but they're getting value from the organization that may help them in their future. And that's going to help certainly keep them engaged and, and plugged in for that period of time. So I think, you know, I, I know there's a few law schools now that actually teach leadership um, to the to the young people trying to aspire to be lawyers. That's a, what a great differentiator. Um, but yeah. I think the same thing in the organization. Um, we launched a strategic vision a few years ago, uh, and, and I created what I called, it's all about becoming a trusted advisor to our key clients, which there's nothing new about that. But if you unpack what clients want, they want you to, a, a, a trusted relationship that knows their business, their industry can be proactive. And so if we really can get better at that, we're going to help impact our clients. Um, but I said, rather than just launching a vision, I said, well, we have to put some legs behind it. And we launched, I called it, people made fun of me, a trusted advisor mini MBA, because it's certainly nothing like an MBA. People that earn that, it's it's well-deserved. Um, but it was it's for everybody. It's for our staff, business services professionals, because everyone has to get, can get better, can get better, doesn't have to, they can choose not to, can get better uh, at building those trusted relationships. And I think that helps differentiate us from other organizations that maybe aren't pouring that kind of training in. So I completely agree with you, Susan. I think it's an opportunity for people. Um, Ooh, we happen to agree. Right, Rob? <laughs> <laughs> Tim, while we're on the training and growth yeah. aspect, like something you had on the website for Everybody Leads is one, well, the first principle was Everybody Leads. The second one was everyone must continue to grow as a leader. Like balancing that, philosophy as and then also the fact that you're a CEO how do you like what would you say to other CEOs that are cutting back on leadership development or even people development because of tight budgets and economic uncertainty yeah and um, I mean that's a great question Rob and, and I think I think that um, to some extent I don't like that was that phrase about you bite your nose to spite your face or whatever. I mean, I, I get the uh, the realities of trying to balance the budgets and, and, and to make sure, uh, you know, you don't have to do layoffs or whatever. Um, but I think there's really not anything, there's very few higher priority than, you know, investing in your people, because I think that ultimately, in my experience with where, my world, <laughs> it has helped um, uh, then drive the economic. Uh, uh, growth of the firm. Um, and even though it's a short term, it may seem like, gosh, how can we do this? I mean, I think you have to double down on it uh, and then look at the ROI, you know, make sure that it is meaningfully impacting and helping your colleagues, the people you that, that work with you um, to, to get better and make progress and that it's turning into the economic um, engine to help the, the organization. But I think that's just not a place to cut um, budget. And again, it's easy to say in a vacuum because you got, I mean, at CEOs, we have very much, very many competing, um, uh, you know, priorities. constituents and priorities and everything. Mm -hmm. But that, and we, you know, when I first became CEO five years ago, 
we really needed to implement a lot of what I call best run business principles because we were we'd kind of gotten we'd plateaued and we did have to make some hard choices. Um, but the investment in our people um, uh, was not uh, uh, something that we felt like we should cut because they're that they're going to feel us getting out of the plateauing and, and to the next level. So and, and it's paid off for us. So I would invest. I think every dollar you invest in your people comes back in multiples to, you know, your stakeholders and to, to the organization. I love it. You're talk, <laughs> talk, we're talking about leadership, both in the context of helping other people grow and surely self-leadership, right? Helping um, ourselves grow. And I know that Rob was asking a second ago about how you make time yeah. for that, but I want to go in a different direction. Like, what is it that you do to stay consistent with your growth? Like, what are those best practices in your self-leadership? Yeah, no, you're right. Exactly. The, the hardest person to lead, I think, is yourself. Um, and, and, uh, um, and, and so I, I invest a lot in it uh, in, of time, I guess, and resources. I've got um, certainly I've invested in kind of like having a leadership coach that's helped me just have a, a, a voice you know, outside the organization that helps me, you know, reflect uh, and to give me insights in other other line, uh, other industries that I don't I don't know. Um, but I, I invest in going to a couple, um, you know, leadership type trainings a year, some in person, some may be on, you know, modules online. Uh, I, I'm a voracious reader. Um, my colleagues kind of make fun of me that, you know, I, I send books to them and sometimes I'll send them <laughs> back and saying I can't read all this stuff, you know, but um. Um, this is making that priority um, to try to make sure um, that I'm reading and staying, you know, being curious. I think the day every day, like you learn from everyone you interact with. And if you try to look at that um, that way, I mean, I, I, I'll talk to other managed partners of other law firms to see, you know, what what's going on with them. And I'll, I'm transparent with them about what's going on. Um, and then the other thing it's real important to me for this. It's kind of it kind of dovetails into self-care, too is I, I like to call them like my daily disciplines. I want to do some reading every morning. I want to get out and try to run uh, or walk every morning. Um, I want to make sure that I'm trying to get a good night's sleep. You know, some of those basic things, I'm trying to eat healthier, you know, um, and I don't do it all the time, all of that. But I, I find that if I'm getting a good routine, that helps with the self-care that then makes me more energized to do more of the other stuff. But um, it's all a balance and it's all what you said is a priority thing. It's a high performance strategy. And so mm -hmm, literally. You're doing all of that. Mm -hmm. and actually, there's I was just reading the other day, there's research out there that says if you uh, do exercise in the morning, it does improve your performance throughout the day. So it's a, oh. it is is a real thing. Um, Tim, I, I gotta ask you, like, tell us about everybody leads and what what birthed that idea and what's it all about? Yeah, so um, it, it really was birthed out of this idea, first of all, that I really fundamentally believe that everybody leads. And just this a continuing recognition of talking to folks that even that have all the best opportunities that are out there, still not having that confidence and belief of themselves as a leader. Um, and so some of that. And then we've worked um, as an organization uh, or with the name Baker Donaldson. We have all these different initiatives that start with Baker. So we have something called Baker Cares. Like my vision is Baker Vision. But Baker Cares is where we try to get every office uh, plugged into an organization in their community along a common theme. And we do it in three year arcs. And so over the last three years, we've really been trying to see if we could help eradicate the, the individuals who are struggling with homelessness. And so we're partnering with a lot of great organizations, nonprofits doing great work. And every time we have a leadership meeting in an, in an office, we'll go visit and tour and try to roll up our sleeves and help. So do that. I got to know a lot of the leaders of these organizations. They're doing incredible things trying to help people through all that, you know, that is really trauma of moving from homelessness to steps along their journey. And some of it's basic life skills, like getting a driver's license and a bank account. And then another layer that they do a lot of is job skill training. You know, they're equipping people to now to start make a living wage so they can move that way. And as I was talking to them, I started saying, well, now that somebody has a job, what kind of training are you able to offer about things like conflict resolution, um, working as a team, you know, showing up every day, and they said, yeah, we would, I mean, that's something we need to do and we try to do it as we can, but it didn't seem as organized around a lot of the, which makes sense. So they get to start with the basics and then the job skill. And so it all just kind of came together with me. I'm, I'm, I'm um, uh, somebody, uh, a good friend of mine had asked me a couple of years ago, what's 10 plus five years and 10 plus 10 years look like? I'm 58. And I started thinking, well, I'd hope I could take some of these leadership skills that I've learned 
um, to maybe, you know, maybe I'll work for a nonprofit or maybe I do, you know, something like that. And then he said, well, why don't you start a nonprofit? And so it kind of all just gelled together. Um, and, um, and, and so I, I launched it. I've been doing and it. And it's like the side gig while I've got this full time job <laughs> in the organization. All that free so, time. <laughs> uh, yeah. So, but, I, but I've got like a college intern. Makai has been great. Um, she's helping me like the, she's helped me set up with some local organizations and I've done it in some other states through the, through the Baker Harris thing to go and just teach some basic leadership skills with um, individuals who may be, you know, had uh, gotten off track through graduating high school. And now there's a, some, a lot of organizations doing good work, trying to help with skill building there. Uh, folks who have come back out of uh, from prison and are trying to do re-entry. Um, and so it's been working with some of those organizations and it's a work in progress. Um, I've got a training manual. I've got a book called Everybody Leads that kind of is the framework of this that I'm, you know, trying to see what happens with that to help do some funding for it. So it's all a work in process, but it's been very rewarding because it feels like it does make a difference with individuals when I've been able to do um, the training. So. <laughs> uh-huh. And what are, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. I want to hear more. What is, what is Tim in 10 years? <laughs> or who is Tim in 10 years? <laughs> oh, that's, oh, that's a good question. Okay. Like, I feel like I'm on the couch now, right? You know, uh, <laughs> talking to my therapist. We'll get you there. We'll get um, you there soon, um, Tim. <laughs> no. So I definitely, so I definitely um, feel like, so I, I, I did launch the, the vision uh, that runs with the firm through 2028. And then um, I would think that at that point I would think about, um, you know, some form of then succession um, tra- and the firm's as really gracious that I could stay and keep, practicing law, although I really think the vision is more towards wanting to um, uh, to uh, work with in the nonprofit sector and uh, whether it's, you know, really building everybody leads and then that could be what I do full time or whether it's something along those lines, um, helping other organizations. I mean, I think it's definitely something like that. I don't I'm full time leading and I'm not practicing law. I haven't for five years and I loved practicing law. I loved my clients, but I don't see myself rolling back to that when I finish doing the role here at the firm. So um, I think that's kind of the things that I'm thinking about. <laughs> Time for service. Course, right. right. Well, and, and of course, you know, if, let's say the book does well, then I can go talk on that and then help Ooh. fund the nonprofit. I mean, you know, it's, things like that would be great because I love people and that would be a lot of fun to me, but you know, <laughs> I'm curious what some of those skill sets are that new leaders or people who are new, at least to the idea of leadership and the fact that they actually are a leader. What, what are some of those key skill sets that every new leader should start building? Yeah, well, I know um, with particular to the training I've been doing, and again, I'm saying these are all of them, but these are folks that are really trying to recognize themselves as that. I mean, it's some of the stuff I mentioned, like conflict resolution and teamwork, um, humility, building trust. Um, you know, showing up, um, um, you know, how to make decisions, you know, um, is some, you know, is, is hard because I think that's some, and a lot of this all grew out of what I struggled with, <laughs> um, uh-huh. and, and stuff, um, and, you know, uh, showing appreciation. Um, so those are some of the things that we've kind of built those modules about building relationships and all of that. And, and, um, and talk about that, um, you know, as far as, I mean, you can go all the way to like the what the Posner and Cruises wrote that book, Leadership Challenge. I mean, they say that the things that people most admire in leaders are things like visionary and being honest and um, being capable. So I think those are things that also are important for sure, that maybe that's level 201 courses. I mean, although you have to build them at the base level, but um, those are some things I, I think about. Tim. Like, of course, of course, we're in 2024 and things are changing pretty rapidly, or at least since the pandemic, it's yeah. leadership has needed to shift. What, what are some of the skills that leaders need today that will help them succeed in 2024 and beyond? Yeah, uh, that's a great question, Rob, and I completely agree. And, you know, I've seen um, some studies that suggest that, you know, whereas maybe, you um, uh, the last century was all about, you know, IQ and, and intel. It's that this century is more about EQ, emotional intelligence, and I do think there's some truth to that. Um, but as the, as we came through the pandemic, I kind of I, I like acronyms because I, I kind of go through them in the morning. Some some of the ones that are real critical, and so I came up with this idea as we were leading in the pandemic. But uh, I, I think it's still applicable now. Uh, the, the the acronym of courage, because I think to be a leader today, um, you really do need to be kind of courageous. Because I think there's just a lot. And I don't mean like 
rah, rah, let's go conquer the next hill. But I just think it's, it's hard. Um, and so the, how I kind of came through it in, in, in during COVID was the C was kind of confidence. And, you know, because I was just a reminder, like I said, I struggled some with with that imposter syndrome. And I'm like, and I don't know, we didn't know the playbook as we were coming into the pandemic, you know. And so it was like the confidence that we're going to do the next right thing. Um, but, uh, of course, compassion is another good one you could do for C. And I think curiosity, I think those are really important, but I'll just stick with, I don't want to throw too much out there, but courage, you know, I think confidence, I think to be out front, I think as a leader, sometimes, I mean, I need to have my alone time. I need to have my time to refuel and regenerate, you know, re get myself re-energized. Um, but I, when you're, when you're leading, you have to be out front and um, you may not make everyone happy, but um, you need to be doing what you think is the best interest. I think out front, unshakable. I mean, resilience is another way to think about that. I mean, things can come at you and you can have a setback, but you got to keep moving forward. I think that's more important today because it's such a complex world we're in and things come at us so fast. So just to be unshakable, to be adaptable is the A. Um, I think that, you know, what we did even last year doesn't necessarily mean it's going to work this year. We had a record year last year. That's great. But we have to think about, well, how do, what do the clients want this year? You know, what's different? Um, so adaptable, a growth mindset, uh, I know y'all even did an episode recently uh, with the, the growth versus fixed mindset. I'm a big believer of the growth mindset and how that's, I think, to be an effective leader in this century and in this 2024, you need that. Um, and then just to be an encourager. Our, our people, all of us need encouragement. Um, you know, I, I have in my desk drawer with a rubber band around it, you know, a stack of notes that people have sent me over the last five years. I've been CEO just that are, you know, very kind and sometimes I just need to pull them out and say, I'm having a really horrible, no good, bad day or whatever that book is. And I'm just need to read some, some things. So I think that's important to encourage others. So it's a lot that I do at that, but I think, I, I really think that idea of courage um, is what I think I need to live out today in 2024. Courage really is the state that we need to be able to navigate such high levels of disruption and uncertainty. Yes. And I feel like yeah. we we were just talking about this this uh, topic this morning with a previous guest. You know, eighty nine percent of Americans over the last year have said that they're stressed or burnt out. I mean, it's never been more rampant, right? So, what are right. your your tricks of the trade in leadership? Because surely you're experiencing a lot of that pressure yourself at the helm, right? Both oh, at, at, the legal world at, and the nonprofit world. But what are your tricks of the trade for managing that stress? No, absolutely. Um, totally agree um, with that, Susan. And, and it really is, it's a battle because, I mean, you because you, you, people are looking to you to lead and it just mm. is really hard. Um, I mean, I, I definitely, I have, I have a therapist I meet with um, regularly, probably every four to six weeks, we kind of do it. And just to be able to, you know, unpack, we're in the middle of um, shareholder compensation season at our firm. And that's always the most stressful draining time because you know it's what people make and uh and so like i purposefully set my call last week with him because or our video chat because um i knew i was just going to be in a bad and i was in a really rough spot and so we were just talking through it and, and like that is critical if i'm doing the daily disciplines that's some me time to be outside in nature to run i just love running outside i mean i'm nothing against the treadmill um i'll do that in hotels sometimes when i'm traveling but um just to be able to be attuned to that, that helps me. I've tried, um, and I guess I'm running about 80% during a year. I try to take like a 24 hour, you know, sub Sabbath or whatever um, that I've learned from some of my colleagues who are Jewish and really studied that kind of aspect of, and I do, I, it's worked for me more from like Saturday at 5 p.m. to Sunday at 5 p.m. I try to get off devices, don't work, just do other stuff. Um, it doesn't work every Sunday, but I do track it to make sure I'm doing it. And I can tell when I've, like, I've missed the last two because I'm doing this comp stuff, but I'm really looking forward to this weekend. I'm getting back to, to doing it. So, unplugging. Um, yeah, unplugging. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, th those are some things. I mean, and then like, I get fired up by live music. I get fired up by the arts. And so like, um, you know, and I like all kinds of music. So like I'm going to symphony tonight, whereas maybe I'll go to, a, you know, some other concert in a couple of weeks or go see a movie. I love going to all the Academy Award, you know, nominees for Best Picture. I don't like them all, but they're normally it's high art. Um, so it's things like that that I know I need um, and then try to lead that through the firm. And we really focus a lot on mental health and wellness with our colleagues and talk about it, talk about my struggles and things. So. 
I'm curious, like what those strategies are for your lawyers, because I've had worked with a lot of lawyers over the last 17 years in practice. Yeah. And I'm I'm sorry to say they're my most burnt out clients of them all, no. right? Because they struggle so much with setting those boundaries to protect the time for self care and active recovery, right? So, what do you the, tell them? It is, and and we're and and the stand, the, you know, our clients are demanding more, and the expectations to drive performance, the high performance is getting even higher. Um, so we just we um, excuse me, we do a lot. Um, it's interesting because we've got um, we've had uh, like all of our young lawyers, associates, we call them. They have access to um, licensed psychologists that the firm will pay for for a few sessions. Um, we certainly have the EAP program and things like that where people can access that. We do programs on it. We just had a program a couple hours ago. Uh, today, when we're recording, is International Women's Day. We had someone um, that was talking about um, energy management and how that intersects with um, uh, all the uh, issues relating to um, uh, you know burnout and and all of that. Um, and so, uh, and we're building it. We're actually right now undergoing some thoughts about how can we even get better at that. So I guess more to come. Um, but we do we we do programming, um, have video conferences um, and things like that um, to try to support that. And then when we get together and meet, like we had our, I think I mentioned we had our 50 or 60 leaders together a couple of weeks in Atlanta. We had licensed psychologists come talk. We've had the same one the last couple of years talking more about how. As a leader, we can identify burnout and issues with the people we're leading. Mm -hmm. And we just knew, our COO, COO and I knew that we just needed to have her come speak to our leaders and all of us, me, you know, all of us included. And that was so well received because people just needed to be able to hear that. So those are some of the tactics we've used, but by no means is it all. And um, but you're right, Susan, it's, it's this profession is off the chart on issues like burnout and dependency. Um, and a lot of that has to do with just the pressure, the stress, the, uh, you know, as a group, a, a, a attorneys are more on, you know, they, they prefer, um, you know, to be left alone. They're more critical because that's what they're paid to do. And so then that just becomes a, so it's, it's a, it's a challenge for sure. Mm. Or that could be intentional. Or, or an opportunity, right? right? That's Depending right. Oh, on yeah. your perspective. <laughs> exactly. That's right. It is an opportunity because if you can, if you can really invest, again, it goes back to if you invest in our people, people. our high performing yeah. shareholders, that just helps the organization. Um, and we do, we do individual coaching for um, some of our high performing um, colleagues uh, because it is, it's just the pressure is, is intense. Mm -hmm. It's, it's interesting, right? And, and, I've seen it with a few of my clients is there's the external pressure and then there's the internal pressure. And a lot of it is actually their own mindset. Just, just yep. what you mentioned, Tim, about being right. able to give yourself that 24 hours of a disconnect. Mm. Right. That is your own choice where you're leading yourself. Right. A lot of folks, they're still learning that aspect where it's their manager is not demanding it. And so right. it's a, it's both, it's definitely both. And, and, but it's great. I mean, what's, what's ab absolutely perfect is you're modeling that for your folks. And so yeah. that's ultimately what we teach a lot of our clients, right? Is like, you have to lead and you show because people are watching you. <laughs> right, right. Oh, that's right. The model carries the most weight. Right. 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 Yeah. Oh, and yeah. a lot of I mean, times they look to you when the, the stress is high to know how to feel. Right. So oh, that's right. Yeah. We had a couple hours of meetings talking about compensation, you know, and they're all in the middle of it because they're talking. And and, uh, and uh, there were a couple of times I was getting a little bit hot under the collar, but I realized like I got to be calm through this. And that is, you know, because that's right. They're, it's all it's a hard process. And so we have to get through it. So. I'm curious in all this wonderful work that you're doing in the world to spread the ripple effect on the importance of leadership development for yourself and for your people. What do you want the legacy of all of that to be? I mean, it's really a great question. And uh, I guess as I've gotten older, you do start, I mean, I, I, you start thinking about that. You know, I, when I was, I don't know where this came from, uh, but when I was younger, uh, I really got this idea that I really wanted to change the world. Um, and, and that was a little bit like, um, it was also like a weight on me because of like, well, I'm not going to change the world. And then I read something, um, about this idea that uh, I don't have, I may not change the capital W world, but I can change the lowercase W world where I live and where I'm interacting. 
And so I guess I do still aspire to that. I'm, I change the world that I'm in. And that means like the people that I'm around and that I've helped them, you know, believe in themselves and help them to really um, try to accomplish their dreams and their goals. That would be really fulfilling to me. I mean, certainly uh, my daughter got married three weeks ago and that my legacy definitely is that hopefully I've launched her well and um, we love her husband and all of that. I mean, so that, that would be first and foremost, but then as the ripple goes out, um, it would be just to help people believe that they can accomplish great things, whatever that means to them. And I've helped them somehow along the way. That You're living that legacy. Notes, <laughs> I'm trying. The I'm trying. Full letters is already proof of that. Literally. Uh, <laughs> Literally. Uh, oh, Amazing. Great. Tim, uh-huh. it's been an absolute pleasure. And for folks out there, of course, so you can check Tim out, everybodyleads.org bakerdonaldson.com and I've dropped Tim's LinkedIn in the podcast notes as well. So you can connect with him there. Is there anywhere else you want folks to find you? No, that you've just gone through where you can find me and uh, I'm cool. I love talking to people and interacting with new folks. So please do reach out. Yeah. Amazing. And then obviously for us, hit subscribe to Leadership Launchpad on your favorite yeah. podcast platform. And for all things leadership development, Head on over to EliteHighPerformance.com for all of that. Susan, is there anything you want to leave folks with today? I love this message. And and, uh, everybody needs to get out and find this book. Everybody leads. Where can we find that book? Is it on Amazon? Well, no, it's actually in a draft. And I've got an agent Ah! trying to get it published. So if you know somebody (laughs) who wants to publish a leadership book, uh, and then then we can do that. I feel like this this book needs to be in our freaking school systems. I feel like this is one that we need to try to to pass far and wide, right? Because this yeah. is a big aspect of our mission to change the way this game's being played forever. Really, the way that we're trying to do that is through the dissemination of this type of knowledge. So thank you, sir, for helping us spread our ripple effect here today. Oh, I, I, it's been a joy and this has been the best part of my day and frankly, the best part of my week just to get to Aww. talk to you all. So seriously, I'm sincere. I mean, that this is great uh, to talk to folk, like-minded folks who are really trying, who are impacting the world as you all are. So, yeah, Thank you. And, and you don't have to so talk much. about compensation. So it's, yeah. That's right. <laughs> that's, <the part. laughs> that's right. It's good. Yeah. And yeah, for, for me, I think this is something is incredibly like one is the three principles that Tim you've laid out were incredible. It was actually funny, like early when I was working with Susan, I don't know, five years ago or something, it was like, I didn't believe I was a leader either. And I think this is, this is the first step that folks can take is it's not about having the direct reports or having the positional authority. It's taking that proactive step of choosing to go out and impact folks to be at their best. And that doesn't mean, you know, you have to manage them or, or tell them what to do. It's mm-hmm. literally helping them see themselves and the gifts they bring to the world. Mm. And even telling them that they are a leader. That's another yeah. way you can start to unlock those and everyone else. And so yeah. folks out there, you're a leader, get out there, choose to make the world a better place. Tim, incredible to have you. Thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, thank you. It's been a joy. Everybody listening, thank you so much for listening. And we'll see you all next week. Bye, everyone.